Hey students, uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about the Sun King, King Louis the Fourteenth. okay? And he is the Sun King because as a child he played the role of Apollo in a ballet, which he was very fond of. And he was, of course, known as the Sun King. And it was kind of a cool symbol to replace the Bourbon family Fleur de Lis that we see uh, so prevalent in French society and even in our native Louisville, Kentucky, the namesake of King Louis, okay? But let's get into kind of what we want to focus on in terms of King Louis the Fourteenth. is why is he the quintessential uh, example of an absolute ruler? How does he fit the characteristics of an absolute ruler? Um, and I think if you look at the, you know, the saying that he's very famous for, l'état c'est moi, that says about everything. I am the state. He is every part of the state. He is the political decision maker. He is the economic decision maker. He is the religious decision maker. He will let you know how to live in society in general. And he can do this because one of the characteristics that uh, absolute rulers believe is in divine right, which was advocated by Boussois, which you read about in the Perry book. You know, so again, he had an unquestioned authority because he was handpicked by God to uh, be the king and his family uh, was going to rule this earth in the way that God intended. So that's one characteristic is he is uh, an advocate of divine right and he is going to rule uh, unquestioned um, under that authority. OK, now. You can take well, it was a quick look, but go back and look at your PowerPoint at um, you know, some of the uh, paintings of King Louis XIV. Uh, you can still see it over there on the uh, left of your screen. Also, he's the third picture down. That tells a lot about how they pictured themselves, or actually how they wanted to be pictured as far as their strength, their power, and their grandeur. Um, some of the things that you might want to know about if you ever have a DBQ or LEQ about um, Louis the Fourteenth, as he did have the longest reign in European history, he ruled for seventy-two years. Now that's because he took the reign at five years old, which is uh, going to be a big part of why he became uh, as powerful as he did. Because there's going to be some people try to take advantage of him at a young age. But under his reign, you can see that France is going to become the most powerful um, country in Europe. They're going to have the largest population, which in uh, you know allows them to have the largest standing army. Um, even in peacetime, even though uh, Louis is going to be at war for uh, two-thirds of his reign. You can see that French culture is going to dominate Europe. I mean, the, the French becomes the international language. Any treaties, any, any discussions amongst different nations, France is the official language. Any official documents, it's going to be the French language. Also, it's going to be the epicenter of literature and arts, and some of the early enlightened thinkers are going to come forth uh, at this time period in France, it's going to be a cultural center. You're going to have a lot of um, groups of people that come together to have, you know, discussions about books, discussions about the art. So it's it's also a very, um, you know, a center for creativity amongst the individuals. Now the Fronde, as I mentioned, he took uh, King Louis the Fourteenth took control as a five year old, um, and that really um, allowed the nobility who had lost some of their power under um, Louis or excuse me Henry the fourth and wanted to fight back and get some before Cardinal Maslin or excuse me until Cardinal Richelieu took power under King Louis the 13th well the same type of thing is going to happen under uh, when Louis the 14th gains control and it's really being run by Cardinal Mazarin the sword nobles those who felt like they're losing their prestige wanted to gain control of uh, France once again. And so, you know, some of these sword nobles, along with some of the Parisians, um, are going to, in essence, start a civil war. Um, but Mazarin and uh, some of the uh, robe nobles are going to be able to defeat them. But this is going to be a one of those events that sticks with King Louis XIV. He was actually driven out of his home at one point during this war. And he felt humiliated. So one of the things is that he's going to do throughout his reign is make sure he has this total control over all groups, including uh, the sword nobility or the old nobility. Um, that's going to be a major focus, which, again, that's one of the characteristics of an absolute ruler. 
If you take a look at how he set up his government, this has absolutism written all over it. Um, he's going to use the middle class or rogue nobles to carry out his day-to-day uh, -day operations. He's going to continue the intendant system. Again, both those, the idea behind him is to get his power out of the nobility's hands and put it in the hands of people that are going to be loyal to the king. Um, you can see that he nullified the institutions that might challenge him. That includes the clergy. That includes the nobility. That includes parliament right here, which was a group of nobility who would, you know, get together and kind of be advisors to the king. Well, that's not going to happen. Um, and you can see that officials who criticize the government would be arrested. And then lastly, down there at the bottom, the estates general. That's where you have representatives from each estate. The first estate clergy, second estate nobility, third estate was everybody else. Now, the third estate was usually represented by lawyers or, you know, some of the high middle class um, at that point. And they would get together and they would vote on certain things for France. But under King Louis XIV, he doesn't need that group. Okay, and so for 72 years, he's never going to call them and they're never going to meet. Um, he's basically going to put a lock on it and say, no need for you. Okay, I am the son, King L'Etat, c'est moi. Um, I, I just don't need any input. I got it. He's also going to get control of the peasants, okay? Now, even though um, you can imagine there's going to be some revolts, he's going to be able to handle that pretty quick. And you can see that the peasants are really ones hurting right here. Oh, they only can keep 20% of their cash crops. After, that's after they're paying their landlord, their taxes, um, their church tithes. All of that goes into it. So they really have enough just to eat at this point. On top of that, they have to work um, a certain amount of time every month on, you know, the, the country's infrastructure, the roads, and there might be other public projects. And that was called a corvée. And Louis said that this was the way that they participated in the government's action. They, everybody had a role in French society. Well, the peasants, they had to uh, work um, uh, so much uh, throughout a month on government projects. Um, you know, I've had students that want to compare that to um, kind of the encomienda system in the uh, colonies at this time as well. I, I don't know if it's that harsh, but um, it definitely put a strain on uh, the peasants because if you're working for the government and not really being paid for that, you're not able to work for yourself and thus, you know, your ability to earn goes down. Now, anybody who refused to work um, or, you know, was caught, you know, not contributing to um, their land or the government themselves, they were put into the military or into, um, well, they were like labor camps, but they were called workhouses. Um, and, you know, the, the reason why peasants would want to stay away from the army is um, if you're fighting at this time, you have a high likelihood of dying, especially in those ranks of the military. Um, any contact with other countries, you're susceptible to disease. Um, and that, that would kill more than just the fighting in itself. Whoops. And of course, as you can imagine, <laughs> you don't um, follow the rules. You don't follow the uh, law of the land. These intendants that are placed around in your area, they would have no problem with um, killing you or putting you uh, as slaves on these uh, ships. Now, this is kind of um, a symbol of who King Louis and some of these absolute rulers were, is not only is it enough for me to uh, rule in absolute, I, you, I've got to have a sense of grandeur about myself. And that's what the Versailles Palace became under King Louis XIV. Um, it, it used to be a hunting lodge, and under King Louis XIV, he created a palace. Now, the reason reason he did so is he wanted this to be the home of not only himself but he wanted it to be the home of all the government offices he wanted the business of France to take place in this palace he created all kinds of you know different things for where the nobility would sleep um, huge you know outdoor areas for you know gatherings he would have you know grottas and there were there are also kind of play places as well um, and so the the palace encompassed basically a small city for Louis's um, desires 
you can see that it was a way for him to show off his power. All this wealth that's coming in from the uh, colonies, all the wealth that's coming in from the taxes, it's going to Versailles. You can see that the cost of maintaining it was 60% of all the royal revenues. He's spending about the other 40% uh, on uh, military um, aspects, okay? It was about one-third of uh, a mile long of the facade was, and he had 1,400 pounds of that tells you. Can you imagine uh, the, the water needed to do that? And the royal court's going to grow to 10,000. This was the hub where everybody was at. Now, the reason why Louis wanted the nobility there is so he could keep an eye on them, okay? Um, he knew absolutely everything that was going on, um, and that's why he required them to live there. It's kind of like, you know, keep your friends close, keep your enemies closer. Um, but they were entertained with numerous recreational activities, tournaments, hunts, concerts. I mean, there was all kinds of entertainment going on. Um, and that was a big part of, you know, going to the palaces. This was the place to, this was the place to be. I mean, there was everything there. There was nothing you desired at um, Versailles. You can take a look at it right there. Um, and, what, and what's crazy is when... Versailles was built, you basically had this little building right here, which would have been um, the hunting lodge. Um, and now it's basically an entire city. Uh, today you can visit, it's a museum. The Versailles Palace is going to be home to the government until the end of the French Revolution. Now there's going to be some people after that's going to use it. Napoleon's going to use it for certain things. Um, King Louis the Seventeenth is going to use it for a few things, but... After the French Revolution, it's going to lose its uh, place as where the government uh, is. Okay. Again, I, I really encourage you to get online and, you know, take a look. There's some 3D sites that will you can get an inside view of the palace itself. It's very famous for the Hall of Mirrors. And it's been the place where, you know, ever since then, there's been a lot of meetings and treaties. Um, Napoleon was crowned by the Pope in there. Uh, you have the Treaty of Paris, Treaty of Versailles that have taken place, and there is the Hall of Mirrors. Um, and you can see the evolution of that if you uh, look into it. Now, as far as religion, he's going to get this back into absolute power. He's going to get rid of any dissenting groups. All right. Um, he was very Catholic, and we're going to see that not only here, but he's actually going to try to make some deals with some later kings in England to try to make England Catholic as well. We'll get into that in our next lecture. He did not allow the Pope, though, to exercise political power. That was his. He was the appointee of all the top positions. He revoked the Edict of Nantes with the Edict of Fontainebleau, Fontainebleau, whatever you want to do. Um, this is where the Huguenots lost all their rights to practice uh, Calvinism. Uh, as you can imagine, about 200,000 fled France, and they are later um, going to be supported by the Enlightenment and toleration. But at this point, under Louis the Fourteenth, there is no more Protestantism allowed in France. That's kind of taking what Cardinal Richelieu with the Peace of Allah did and uh, eliminated the Protestants altogether. Whoops. Now, he did support the Jesuits in cracking down on the Jansenists. Those were the Catholics who had some or held some Calvinist views. So, again, strengthening that hold on religion. He also had the state's control over the economy. Uh, he wanted to uh, achieve a favorable balance of trade, the whole mercantilism thing. But he also had this idea of bullionism, which is accumulating as much gold and silver as possible without it going to other countries. They wanted to accumulate it. They did not want to trade it. So they might trade for gold and silver, but they're not going to let it out of their country. And that's called bullionism. But you can kind of foreshadow the problem with bullion, bull, bullionism. And I'm going to try to quickly get through Jean-Baptiste Colbert, who is his finance minister, who actually did a pretty good job um, overseeing the uh, mercantilist policies. The main goal, and you have to know this, is they wanted France to be self-sufficient. Okay, they didn't want to rely on any other country. They didn't want to rely on any other means. He oversaw the construction of roads, um, supported monopolies in certain industries, regulated the guilds or labor unions, reduced tariffs and inhibited trade. 
and then organized French trading companies in